Australians and good uh, night uh, good evening for the Indians. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Professor Pratibhavanu Das today and uh, the topic of the talk, uh, you have already seen it, right? It's, uh, uh, it's the, I forgot the topic, just a moment. Uh, okay, so the topic of the talk is introduction and approximation of weekly singular Volterra integral fractional differential equation based on residual minimization method. And I think he's working uh, on this in this, uh, I think I know him uh, since uh, say seven, eight years, eight or nine years maybe. And uh, we are in contact since a very long time. Huh? So it's a pleasure to invite you professor uh, uh, for the talk in our department. And actually I was trying to invite you since long and we could not figure out one day. So thank you th so much to, for accepting finally. Uh, invite means invite in yeah. Chile or invite online? <laughs> <laughs> Invite online. That much money I can have. Uh, spending on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I spend on my coffee. No, so I stand the talk. That's the only money I can spend. <laughs> okay, so chili, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we 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 will look for it. We will look for it. That's uh, that should not be a problem. Uh, so you will be having something like 50, 55 minutes and then last five to 10 minutes uh, will be for the comments. And and as Rajesh said, if, if it is introduction, it would be beneficial for all the new researchers like master, PhD and postdocs. Yeah, mm -hmm. so please go ahead. Floor is all yours. You can share the screen and we can start. Okay, so let me, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Okay. Yes, now yes, yes, yeah, it's perfectly. Okay, it's already quite late in night, it's around 930. So, um, so let me just start uh, regarding my talk. Uh, this is the introduction and approximation of weekly singular Volterra integral fraction and differential equations. And then there is a method is also there, which uh, I'm going to use to find out an approximate solution of this differential equation. This fractional differential equations is exactly is not my research topic. But I have started to explore a little bit different areas from few year onward. So this is mainly uh, you can consider me as a student, not as a professor. Okay. And uh, I'm mainly work on I mainly work on the numerical analysis side. And but uh, uh, since I'm new in this field, so I'll try to give an introduction what whatever I have understood on what is called fractional derivative and what is the purpose of this fractional derivative as far as I have understood in this field. And then I'll go to the uh, the problem which I'll be considering uh, next. OK, so now uh, so this uh, model is as far as I understood that this fractional idea started around 1695 when the L'Hopital or L Hospital asked Leibniz that what is the meaning of half order derivative of a function? So this is just the, for the curiosity of a mathematician. And then later it turned out that it is possible. Yes. Sorry. Somebody had. Should I continue? See, si, see, si, yeah, please, please. Uh, ah. Mr. Cyan, uh, your mic is on. Okay, okay. Please, okay, so now, now, now yes. this started around 1695 when, just for the curiosity, one mathematician, a law school, a hospital, started to ask one question to Leibniz that what is the meaning of half order derivative? And then later it turned out that there are several ways to uh, answer this question. There are several ways we can approach this question. What is the meaning of half order derivative mathematically? Okay, this mathematically word is important because uh, when we go to the application side, we see very little less applications on fractional derivatives. Rather, what we are having in classical derivatives and so on and so forth. In fact, in uh, we'll also see, I, mean, I have seen, uh, as far as I know, that there is no geometrical meaning of fractional derivatives, though we are having the geometrical meaning of what is called classical derivatives in terms of tangent and slope. OK, so now let me start with the very basic definition of continuity, uniform continuity, and uh, so on and so forth. I'm not going to repeat this definition. So you know that the definition of continuity involves uh, delta is depending on x0 and epsilon. And definition of uniform continuity involves that delta will be independent of this point x naught. Okay, this is the definition of your continuity and uniform continuity. 
But uh, when I'm going to the de de uh, definition of fractional derivatives mainly, there is a question which, uh, genuine question which can come to our mind that, what do you mean by half order derivative? Do I need that the function is what one time differentiable but half time differentiable? Or I need more differentiability than one time differentiable, okay? So for that, since I don't have anything uh, bef uh, before differentiability, so I'm mainly looking into the continuity part, uniform continuity part, and absolute continuity part. And then from there, I'm trying to grasp what could happen, what could be the less regularity I can feature on fractional derivatives or on the definition of fractional derivatives, okay? So uh, if I look into these two definition, continuity and uniform continuity, continuity and uniform continuity both are same if I am considering a compact set. Close, in close interval AV, uh, if the function is continuous, then it will automatically be uniformly continuous. However, in open 0, 1, they are not same. As you can see, when open set, they are not same. That means the observation which I wanted to specify here is uh, by looking into the graph of a function, we would not be able to distinguish two functions. One is which one is continuous and which one is uniformly continuous like that. If I know the uh, domain, then I'd be able to distinguish. The, uh, I'll, I'll be able to say that they are both same. I'll little go to the deep. Let me give the definition of differentiability now. So this is the definition of differentiability everybody knows. <laughs> so now uh, if I stop uh, till now, uh, why do I need the differentiability? So I need mean value theorem and as well as Taylor series expansion, those things. For those cases, I need differentiability. That's why the differentiability definition is important for us. Now, uh, the natural question is uh, whether these properties, continuity as well as differentiability, these properties are local or non-local. Local means what? Local means uh, whether I can uh, have a function which is differentiable at only one point but nowhere else. Whether I can have a function which is continuous at only one point but nowhere else. Okay. So if it is uh, continuous at only one point but nowhere else, then uh, we can say that the top part is local because it is happening only at one point. But if it is uh, uh, if it is not there, I'll come. What what do I mean by non-local structure? Then we uh, basically we'll see later that this non-local properties are mainly uh, required when I'll be going giving the definition of what is called fractional derivatives. Okay. So uh, as you know that there is an example uh, f x equal to x for x rational and minus x for x irrational. Uh, this uh, example, you can check that this uh, function is continuous at x equal to 0, but nowhere else. Okay. Similarly, if you take the example fx equal to x square for x rational and minus x square for x irrational, then you can check that this, uh, this function is differentiable at x equal to 0, but nowhere else. That means continuity and differentiability, these two properties are local. Very local, it, ha it can happen only at one point. However, we are more interested for the non-local properties. For example, integration. If you wanted to integrate A to B, then you need to know the function value, uh, all the values between A and B. This is the rough estimate. So when integration is a non-local property, you can assume. Okay. Now, uh, I'll, I did not give what is the definition of absolute continuity. This, this one I'm going to give at the next slide. Uh, however, there is an inclusion. This inclusion you can get in Wikipedia, assuming that it is correctly mentioned there. So this uh, in com over compact set, I'm having this inclusion. That means uh, I can, uh, uh, of course, you know that the differentiable functions are also having a conclusion, uh, inclusion, which is this one. Continuously differential functions are contained in Lipschitz. Lipschitz function may not be differentiable. Absolutely continuous functions are almost every day differentiable. Bounded variation uh, functions may be discontinuous also. And almost every day differentiable is part is appearing here. Okay, so that means uh, I'm more going to the this side uh, this is, of course, this is a very good function, continuous to differential function. And I am more interested on this part because this is the set of functions where the function may not be differentiable, but almost every differentiable kind of thing will appear. So this absolute continuous uh, function is a little interesting for us. When I, I'll see that uh, this is a little interesting when I'll be dealing with the fractional derivatives and so on and so forth. Okay. So now let us go to the definition of what is called absolute continuity. I'm not repeating this definition, probably you know, but this alternate definition is little useful for our case. I'll explain why. Okay, this is explained. This definition is taken from uh, N.D. Sully's book. There is a numerical analysis book by N.D. Sully, Oxford University. There you can get it. So it says that f is absolutely continuous if there exists an L1 function such that uh, 
f dash equal to g and derivative of f will be integrable. Okay, so I need the derivative of f should be integrable in the interval 0 to x because g equal to f dash. So roughly speaking, I'm just saying roughly the word roughly. Roughly speaking, you need to know f derivative in a neighborhood of the point 0. That means you need to know the value of f dash in the interval 0 to x to find out this integration. Okay, so that means uh, this is not exactly related with the the moment there is a integral part is involving here that is not exactly local. There is something like non-local part is appearing into picture. OK, so I'll, I'll, this will uh, this non-local and local is part is very important when I'll be giving the definition of uh, fractional derivatives. I'll see that later. Uh, so so this absolute continuity will uh, more or less it will appear when I'll be giving the sufficient conditions of the existence of fractional derivatives. OK, so now uh, let me give some examples of uh, just uh, for real analysis point of view. So uh, there is directly no relation between uh, absolute continuity and differentiability. For example, you can have a function which is continuous, but not absolutely continuous because it is its integration, its derivative is not uh, integrable. In addition, I am also having a function which is differentiable, but not absolutely continuous. OK, so this is this is also another uh, uh, an, a little interesting thing. I mean, this actually leads me to think that uh, am I demanding that if I, I am I demanding like uh, if I want a function is having half order differentiable, do I need that the function should be one time differentiable? Is it like that? Suppose I wanted to say that a, a function is half time differentiable. Do I? I, I should I should I always demand that function should be always one time differentiable? Is it like that? These are the kind of questions which will come when I'll be uh, uh, talking about the fractional derivatives. But this is little more interesting. The differentiability does not imply absolute continuity or something like that. I mean, uh, this this one I got in uh, this examples I got in uh, from uh, Google only. So this this part, uh, if it's differentiable, may not imply fractional derivative exist. So this is. Uh, this is little annoying, annoying in the sense uh, when I'll be giving the definition of fractional derivative, then this definition you will see that it is little annoying. OK, so now let me let me go to the definition of what is called fractional derivative. OK, so now before going to the definition, let me try to link what we know in classical sense. For example, we know this is the definition of integration. A function is continuous in the close interval 0, 1. Then I can define integral 0 to x f to dt, and that I am calling as jf. Okay, this one we know. Okay, this is the definition of a. Uh, th this one is the j is the integral operator like this. Okay, now I can uh, differentiate this guy because if f is continuous, then integral 0 to x f will be differentiable by fundamental theorem, and you can differentiate this guy, and you can uh, fundamental theorem calculus, then you can dj of f is equal to f. Okay, there is nowhere the fraction part is coming into picture. Only integer part is coming into picture. Now. Uh, this is JF, so I'm applying JF again on this one. So I'm getting J square F. J square F is equal to, if you do some little calculation, you'll get something like this. And similarly, if you find out JN, JNF means what? That is your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, this integral is appearing n times. You're uh, integrating F n times, integral 0 to X, integral 0 to X, integral 0, like that, with this formula. Then you will get something like this, okay? <coughs> Note that this n is a natural number. This n is uh, n is a uh, there is people are waiting in the lobby. Okay, so this n is a natural number. Okay, so for natural number case, I am having this uh, this uh, this equality. Okay, so uh, I'm doing yeah. I'm not I'm not doing any fractional case. So now uh, I am having d n plus k j k is equal Pratikamai. to d n. This is the uh, definition which I am getting. Now Pratikamai, Pratikamai, one moment, one moment. Rajesh is saying something. Uh, this JNF, uh, what does that mean? Is the second derivative or? No, no, uh, so, so, no this, there is no way der derivative is coming into picture here. So J, J square means, so JF is the integral. J square means double integral. This is the like. Okay. Uh, J mm. means n times integral of the function f. Okay. So suppose okay. I'm having double integral here. Then uh, you can do the calculation. This will be equal to x minus t times ft like this. That is, after the calculation, you can check it. 
So if I'm having n times integral, uh, integral, 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 n times, then I can show that this is equal to x minus t to the power n minus 1 into t. So this is the uh, continuous function, x minus t to the power n minus 1. This is continuous yeah. in the interval but, series. Mm -hmm. huh. Okay. Okay. So this this is the uh, definition of uh, what is called. Uh, sorry, Th this is by simple calculation I can find out what is JNF. This is the one. Okay. So now uh, similarly uh, based on this, since I am having d differentiation and integration is equal to f, so oh, question is what will going to happen if I differentiate this one in plus k times and keep j k as it is. So then I will be having this uh, equality version. Okay. Uh, the extension of this one. Differentiation and integration is equal to f the identity operator like this. Okay, so now uh, the uh, what is the motivation question? Question is here this n is an integer. In particular, it's a natural number. Okay, so the question is what are you going to happen if I replace this n by a fraction, fraction, any fraction, in R, let's say, and uh, then the next question is what will going to happen if I replace this n? By any fraction, which is a positive uh, number, positive real number. Okay, so now uh, first question's answer is little uh, can be given. Uh, for example, suppose I replace n by alpha, where alpha is any real number, then uh, this one may not be defined. Why? Because gamma functions are not always defined for any negative real numbers. Okay, there is an asymptote at uh, all the negative integers. So gamma functions are not defined for negative uh, integers. So if you replace this n by a uh, negative numbers, then this uh, definition deliberately, if you replace n by alpha, it will not be defined. So natural question is, uh, okay, forget about the negative parts. You just consider the positive real numbers and uh, you replace n by alpha. Okay, then uh, this uh, definition will be g alpha f equal to 1 by gamma alpha integral 0 to x, x minus to the power alpha minus 1 ft. So uh, under what condition this uh, definition will be defined is the first question. And the second question is whether I can use this one as a tool to find out uh, a uh, definition of fractional derivative because n is replaced by a fraction number alpha. OK, so the, this this is actually motivating me to the next one. You see that n is replaced by alpha here. OK, this is uh, that is called riemann liouville fractional integral. This is derivative is not coming into picture right now, only in the integral. So this one I'm defining by replacing n by alpha from the previous uh, integer part. I just replaced n by alpha. Huh? Now, of course, the question is, uh, can you give a sufficient condition under which this integral is valid? The answer is uh, if you have a f, which is a L1 function, then uh, this integral comes out to be valid. That is given. Uh, DL Thim, Kai DL Thim has a single author book on Springer and fractional and differential equations. That is the uh, best book in some sense. There it is given that you can have a sufficient condition that uh, if f is in L1, G alpha will be defined and it will be also in L1. Basically, more or less everything is defined in almost every other sense. Okay. Now I will use this integral definition, which is obtained by replacing n by alpha to define what is called fractional derivative. So this is the riemann liouville fractional derivative. So what I'm doing here, this is, I'm, right now I'm defining it only as a definition form. So this one you have seen, dn, dj, n minus k. Okay, from the first uh, one slide before you have seen this one. This one I'm using it as a trick to define what is called uh, riemann liouville fractional derivative. Okay, this is the definition which I am obtaining from the previous uh, one. So oh, there is one part to be observed here. So if f is continuous, uh, they still there is a uh, singular kind of kernel can appear. So you have to be sure that this guy is integrable, and then after that this guy is differentiable. Okay, that you have to be sure. Okay, but since we are not demanding that this whole guy is uh, n times differentiable. Instead, what we are demanding is f should be absolutely continuous. That means uh, absolute continuous of order n. Then this part will be defined. That means uh, we are uh, talking in almost every other sense, not exactly in classical sense. Okay, so this is almost every other sense. So differentiation upward. You can, you can take n equal to one. This will be simple one, and this function has to be differentiable almost every other sense. And uh, 
Now, this Riemann Liouville fractional derivative is uh, there are two fractional derivatives which are mainly popular. One is Riemann Liouville and another one is Caputo. So, based on this Riemann Liouville, I will be defining what is called Caputo Liouville Caputo fractional derivatives. Okay, so that is defined as follows. So, this is uh, Liouville Caputo fractional derivatives are taken by like RL d alpha f minus t n minus one. T n minus one is a Taylor polynomial of order n minus one. What is the Taylor polynomial? Suppose I take uh, n equal to two, then Taylor polynomial of f around the point zero will be uh, f zero plus x f dash zero. Okay. Suppose you take n equal to one, that means t zero. Taylor polynomial is f zero. If you take n equal to two, that means t one. Taylor polynomial will be f zero plus x f dash zero. Okay. So this one, uh, why this Taylor polynomial is coming into picture? It will come. It will. It will be. Uh, Clear in the next slide mainly. So this is the way we can define. Uh, so I got the motivation of Riemann Liouville uh, fractional integral from classical sense. Then after that, I am getting the uh, I am getting the but definition of Riemann Liouville fractional derivative by differentiating it. Then after that, by using Riemann Liouville Prati fractional derivative, I am. Pratibha Moy, Pratibha Moy, Rajesh is saying something again. Yeah, Rajesh, yes. please. No, uh, sorry to disturb you. Can you please go to the um, previous slide once more, just to show? Um, yeah, and yeah. yeah. First, you define riemann liouville fractional integral, no? Yes. Yeah. And then, so this how is, do you this define is the that? Riemann liouville fractional integral. Here, I am yeah. replacing n by alpha. Yeah. Yeah. This is j alpha. I am getting. Then. I am using this g alpha here. Mm. So this is the integer. N, this n is an integer. So mm. this is the classical derivative. So I know what mm. is it. But j n minus alpha, n minus alpha can be a fraction. So I have to define what is j n minus alpha meaning of that that I have defined previously. Yeah. Uh, so based on this, I am defining. So if you if you evaluate this one, then you will get this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Thank if you. If you have it, then we'll get this. Okay. Yeah. Now, using this Riemann Liouville, I'm defining what is called Caputo by uh, by subtracting that uh, t n minus one. That is a Taylor polynomial f zero plus x f dash zero. Okay. So uh, this there is a purpose on why this uh, Taylor polynomials are coming into picture because uh, integral operator and uh, differential operator are not commutative. Okay. So this this there is a uh, that that will come in the next slide. So uh, so as you can see from here, so for the Caputo type fractional derivatives, derivatives are appearing inside. Okay, so these derivatives are uh, whereas for Riemann Liouville derivatives are appearing outside. Okay, so this is there is a uh, uh, Pratip Moy. Yes. Uh, is it because when you integrate after differentiating, you have a constant of integration? Is that has that to do with? Sorry, sorry, sorry. This what is it? Huh? No, you you said that the integral and and the derivative don't commute. Huh. So in the sense that when you differentiate and then integrate, you this make it. The constant time appears, no? Yeah. So that's huh. why, right? Huh, that's why. That's why. Huh. So when you do several times, then you will get a polynomial. Huh, then I get a polynomial. That polynomial is this one actually. Uh, yeah. This 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 one is linked with that polynomial. Roughly okay. speaking. Okay. Yeah. So now here you see that uh, the derivative part is appearing inside, and uh, uh, there the derivative part is appearing outside. Okay. So uh, there is a natural question one can ask that if f n is continuous, okay, then uh, suppose n belongs to zero to one, okay. So that means f, f dash. This one will be f dash. So if f dash exists, then uh, is it is it sufficient that d alpha f will exist or not? Because uh, if dash exists and here I am demanding alpha equal to half, that means function is one time differentiable in place, function is half time differentiable. That is a little bit annoying. Because I should say that function is one time half time differentiable, but not one time. That is much more interesting. But here it is op opposite side. So this one can be linked like uh, uh, if f is absolutely continuous, that means it is not exactly differentiable. But it is almost a differentiable. So this part is replaced by almost a differentiable 
function. So you find out the derivative of that function, measure theory or whatever it is. Then you find out this integral. Uh, that integral. Uh, <coughs> so now that that time I am not demanding f to be at least one time differentiable. So that means uh, I can demand that uh, half time differentiability does not demand one time differentiability. One time may imply half time, but half time requires one time that is a little bit annoying. Okay, but if you have uh, f uh, f is in C one. Suppose n equal to one and f dash is continuous function, then this integral is valid. Okay, you can check because this is n minus alpha. This is this then this integral will be valid. You can check and then uh, one time implies half time. Okay? So if you have a good thing, then you can always have uh, the half part. Okay, so now I'll see the consequences. Uh, consequences are as follows. Uh, so uh, of course here you see that alpha lies between n minus one to n. Okay, so natural question is uh, if I take alpha tends to n, then I'll get d n. That means the classical derivative back or not. And the next question is if I take alpha tends to n minus one, then I'll get the uh, uh, d n minus one back or not. Okay. So as you see that gamma zero equal to one, but uh, there are places where gamma functions are not defined. Okay, so it turned out since gamma zero gamma zero is not defined, it turned out as alpha tends to n, I can get the classical derivative, but as alpha tends to n minus one, I will not get the classical derivative back. So that means if alpha belongs to one to two, as alpha goes to two, I am getting the classical derivative, but if alpha goes to one, I may not get the classical derivative back because gamma zero, gamma one equal to one and so on. So forth. okay. So now uh, d alpha c is equal to zero. This is also uh, uh, it's a very interesting question that constant functions fractional derivative will be always uh, zero or not. So here, uh, if you differentiate this guy constant function, it is automatically giving you zero. So zero integration uh, will come to be a constant, something like that. Zero integration will be zero. Okay, but however, outside if you differentiate, then uh, you check that the constant functions, uh, fractional derivative, Liouville Kapoor and Riemann Liouville, both are coming out to be uh, zero or not. Okay, uh, and of course this one I have explained that uh, they are not commutative because uh, as Rajesh was telling that this part is okay for integer order case also, but this part is having. Uh, extra term because integral of a uh, function integral of constant is a integral of function is uh, adding a constant always. Okay, so this is why they are not commutative integral and differential operators. Okay, and uh, of course there are some uh, peculiarity part is also involved that uh, we can always know we always know that differentiation of a polynomial. Okay, that is not uh, not always zero. If we talk about the integer case, but uh, it turned out that if beta less than or equal to n minus one, that will come out to be equal to zero. So you have to check that what is the relation between alpha. There is no. There you have to talk. You have to work on the range on alpha. You cannot work on alpha. You have to talk on the work on the range on alpha. N minus one and n. Based on this range, uh, you have to check that x to the power beta derivative is coming out to be zero or not. Okay. This is poor part only. Okay. Now uh, let us come to the this part. Uh, so, what are the possible consequences? <laughs> okay. So, as you see that uh, we are always having a, a Pinot's existence theorem. Pinot's existence theorem says that uh, du equal to f of x comma u. Du is the classical sense, and as long as f is a continuous function, it will have a solution. It may have more than one solution, but it may have at least one solution. It will have. So this Pinot's existence theorem is working here also. I am having two solutions, but uh, there are some other parts like if differentiable does not does not may not imply that Kapoor fractional derivative exists because if derivative may not be in L1. Okay, so of course uh, I need to point out that the definition requires sufficient condition as absolute continuity. Okay, it's not a necessary condition. Absolute continuity is sufficient condition. Okay. Uh, now this one is a little uh, interesting thing which you will not see uh, for classical derivatives. For classical derivatives, uh, if f is a continuous function, 
then we say that the solution will be in CM. Vf is continuous. Suppose you take f as a constant, then uh, solution will be automatically in CM. But this is not true for fractional case. For example, gamma 3 by 2 is a constant number. So it's a constant. It's an analytic function. But if you can, if you find out the uh, function, uh, uh, the solution of this uh, linear problem, this is a linear problem, then it turned out that this function is not even uh, differentiable. Okay. This guy is analytic, but this guy's solution may not be even in C1. Okay. This are the so why do I need this? Uh, what would be the problem if the function is not in C1? Problem is uh, when I'll be going to the numerical analysis, uh, I need uh, more smoothness than what is given in the problem. Okay. So for example, in the problem, suppose I'm giving the solution is in C1, then I need at least C2 for the error analysis. So here, as you can see that the data are all uh, uh, analytic, but the function, but the solution is not even uh, differentiable. That is not in C1, okay? So this, are the, this will lead to some problems. There is another uh, uh, consequence I wanted to point out here. Uh, if F is continuous and lifts it, Picard's theorem, or it's not exactly Picard's theorem, but you can say that U will be in CN minus one. That means alpha is in, as long as alpha is a natural number, uh, we are having u is in cn minus one. If f is continuous and lifts with respect to y, u. Okay, but this is not true as I have shown in the previous slide. Two tests. Okay, so this u for fractional case it will be in cn if and only if f zero u zero equal to zero. That means this is a very it, it is posing a very restrictive condition that f at zero u zero should be equal to zero. This. For example, suppose you are having a constant function here. Suppose f equal to one plus u or one plus u square, then uh, this condition will not be satisfied. One plus u square. Okay. Pinot's theorem gives the existence, but uh, we cannot have a in time differentiable function which will be satisfying this uh, fractional uh, derivative problem. Okay, so that, that that is actually creating problem for the numerical analysis. Okay, okay. So now this is the uh, main property which I wanted to emphasize, uh, and uh, for which I have uh, started my uh, lecture from continuity differentiation as well as absolute continuity. So here, uh, this whole purpose of this slide is to show that the definition of fractional derivatives, there are plenty of fractional derivatives, no matter what definition you consider, they should all have this property that, that the derivative is a non-local property, the fractional derivative is a non-local property. So classical derivative, classical continuity is a local property. I have given the example, x for rational minus x for irrational. But here, this is an example which says that uh, if you, so for example, let me just compute it. So ux2 minus ux1 is equal to integral 0 to x1, x2 minus x2 by alpha minus 1, f. So how did I get this one? This alpha is the fractional order. So I just uh, take the uh, Riemann Liouville integral both side of d alpha u equal to f, and I got this. Okay. So now see that suppose alpha is an integer. Suppose alpha equal to 1. Then what will happen? Alpha minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. That means 0 minus 0. So this part is not having any problem. So th this is giving you zero only. And this is alpha equal to one. That means one minus one equal to zero. So that is integral x1 to x2 f. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so this actually tells me that uh, if I am dealing with the classical derivatives, then I don't need to know the solution value. Solution value is appearing here. I don't need to know the solution value between x1 to x2. However, if I am dealing with the fractional derivative where alpha not equal to 1, then this part will be also there, this part will be also there. So this part will be also there. Then I have to know the solution value between x1 to x2 to find out uh, the solution at x2. That means if I wanted to find out the solution at x2, I need to have all the informations from 0 to x2. This is one uh, typical part which uh, in general we don't need for classical sense as well as for 
continuous functions. Okay, but for fractional chaos, this is uh, very important. Classical say no need of any information of ux uh, in between the interval zero to x one. That means uh, because if I take alpha equal to one, then this, this both two parts will one minus one equal to zero. This whole part will go away. Only this part will be left. Okay, so this is a very important thing which. Uh, this is actually motivating. Uh, this is the only application which is having, uh, uh, which is there in the fractional derivatives, which is there in any integral equations. If even if you are considering integral differential equations, you also need uh, this non. You also have this non-local structure, and since fractional derivatives definition is uh, uh, including an integral inside or outside the derivative, that means. That is also having a non-local structure. You need to have all the informations of past if you wanted to work on present. So this is uh, this is what is mentioned here. To compute ux2, it is necessary to take entire history from zero to x2. Okay, this is this is the main uh, application of uh, fractional derivatives. Okay. Now I'm leaving the application part. This uh, this is a concrete application, but I just wanted to point out there are plenty of uh, fractional derivatives like uh, logarithm type uh, based on different different kernels. If I change the kernels, then I'll be having different different fractional derivatives. And as you can see that uh, uh, I can have a singular kernel also. I can have a non-singular kernel also. Non-singular means uh, uh, at x except at one point, so let's say x equal to. I, I'll, I'll give an example when I'll be taking the model problem. What is mean by weakly singular cardinal? Okay, so this is the uh, this is the model problem. Let me just consider. Uh, this is little. I'm going towards the research site. Uh, so there are al uh, two things are there. One is alpha. Alpha is the fractional derivative. Is the nth order, n minus one to n. Okay, so you see that alpha. If alpha equal to half. Then also I need one one initial condition to find out the solution of this one. At least one. If alpha equal to three by two, then I need two initial conditions because it depends on the domain at which alpha lies. Okay. So based on the value of alpha, I need number of initial conditions for this initial initial value. Of and there is a mu is also appearing. This mu is the main culprit for Considering this problem as a weakly singular problem, because if this guy k times x minus t to the power minus mu, if this guy is not continuous at x equal to t, then only we'll call this one as a weakly singular kernel. If it is continuous at all the points, then it is not uh, this. Then we call it regular kernel. Okay, so you can consider this whole thing as a kernel. This whole thing is a kernel. Okay, so that means it is the nth order. Initial value problem for uh, the weakly singular case. And I, I will see that what would be the possible uh, <coughs> difficulties we can face. Now, this k is sufficiently continuous so that I can have a bound on k. This m will be appearing in the Banach uh, contraction mapping principle that is appearing here in the existence uniqueness theorem. So, the, the purpose here is you see that uh, the domain is 0t. However, uh, it appears that based on the value of alpha and mu, I can ensure the existence and uniqueness only in a part of this domain. Okay, so for example, suppose alpha equal to one and mu equal to zero. Okay, in that case, initial as long as all the functions are continuous, this problem will be having solution in zero to infinity. Even if, if uh, zero to infinity or zero to if, if it is it's, it's a linear problem, so zero to infinity. Okay. However, since it is a fractional form, alpha and mu is appearing. We'll show that even if you specify the domain zero t, solution may exist in a part of this domain. So that's what is pointed out here, that the domain is also appearing uh, inside uh, the contraction. So basically, we will be using the contraction mapping principle from C01 to C01 with maximum norm. And it turned out that we need a condition on alpha mu as well as capital T. Okay. Of course, the next question will be whether this con uh, this condition can be uh, relaxed or not. Okay. Because it is taken based on the maximum norm. C01 with maximum norm. I have taken it. 
So uh, it turned out that if we change the norm from maximum norm to some other norm, let's say weighted norm, this one, then we can relax this condition of existence uniformness, provided we are having sufficient smoothness of the latter. Okay, so the, the uh, theorem is also proved. I'm not, I'm, uh, as proof part is also given here, but I'm trying to skip the proof part. Uh, the proof part is some rough idea on the ex uh, uh, on the extension of this uh, uh, solution to the whole domain is given, just like in Picard's theorem, what is uh, given, but I'm skipping that continuous uh, principle. Okay, so now let me come to the approximation side. What is called homotopy perturbation? This is a semi-analytical approach. What it does is uh, it uh, um, it divides the operator given operator into two parts, a one and a two. One part is solvable. Another part I don't need to solve, but if I solve only one part, suppose I am solving a one v equal to f one, which is solvable easily. The solution of that guy will be a curve. From that curve, I'll try to approach the solution curve. This is the rough idea of this homotopy perturbation. So, for example, so this is I am constructing a homotopy here. As we can see, that a one is a differential operator. That means it's containing the fractional derivatives. So, if I take p equal to one, uh, p equal to zero, then this guy will go out, and this guy will be leaving. So what I'll do is uh, I'll try to solve a one v equal to f. That is much more simpler problem compared to the given problem. And I'll try to fix that this satisfies the initial condition. The solution of this guy will be a curve. Based on that curve, so this the solution of a one v equal to f will be a curve. So I'm taking h v zero equal to zero. So from this curve, I'm trying to approximate. To the solution curve, which is AV, which is the solution of AV equal to F. Okay, so there is why the perturbation part is coming into picture because I wanted to write down the solution as a series form. This is the series form. Yeah. We'll write down the solution as a series form where, uh, and then we'll try to compare the coefficients p, p square, p cube, and then I'll get what is called uh, uh, different different operators. I'll solve it. What is p naught, b one, b n? I'll get a uh, series solution. Okay. So now series solution, uh, uh, of course, series solution, you have to show the convergence that it will converge to the function B. And then again, you have to show that uh, that converge will converge to the solution U itself. Okay. So now for the approximation part, of course, we cannot take uh, infinitely many terms. We have to take only finitely many terms. So we'll take the uh, partial sum of this series. We'll find out an approximation, which is a function of X only. So this is this is providing me an approximation of the solution u. Okay, this one is providing me an approximation of the solution u. Okay, so now uh, I have to do the error estimate also. That what will be the uh, required error which I can obtain, and then I have to also show that uh, this is going to converge to the solution. Okay, the convergence of the solution can be obtained by using uh, what is called. Uh, uh, so this is the partial sum. This will be the approximation of the solution. Uh, I will show that phi n minus original solution u will be less than or equal to some quantity, which is the error. So this is uh, this is how the series solution approximation goes. And uh, convergence will come uh, from Western same test because I am uh, working on a sequence of functions. If not, if not plus f1, if not plus f1 plus f2 like that, I am having a sequence of functions. And I can use Western same test to show that this sequence will converge uniformly converge to some function. And I also have to be sure that that function will be the solution of this original problem. I'm skipping the proof part. But this part is uh, this is how the analysis plus approximation goes. OK. OK, so now uh, now the least square homotopy perturbation. Uh, I'll explain what is that least square. So in homotopy perturbation, I'm mainly doing. Uh, let me just OK. Is not there. Uh, I'm mainly doing uh, v naught plus v one piece plus v two piece square like that. Okay, so v naught is a function, v one is a function, uh, v two is a function. So here you can see v naught is a function, v one is a function, v two is a function. Okay, so this v naught, the moment I found out what is v naught and v one and v two, what I'll do is I'll try to find out some uh, functions from this v naught, v one, v two. 
and i'll try to construct a basis so that a perfect combination of those basis elements will be providing better results than this let me repeat it again what i wanted to say suppose v not equal to 1 and v1 equal to x plus x square and v2 equal to x plus x square plus s cube okay so i am constructing a basis from this three what 1 x x square now i am already having a combination of 1 x square here that i have obtained from hpm okay so what i'll do is i know the basis elements 1 x square and i'll choose some other combination by using list square so that this that combination provides better approximation less error compared to the compared to what we are having here okay. this is the whole idea of uh, uh, the list square plus uh, modified list square okay so now here i have to ensure that v2 may not contain all the functions which v1 is having Suppose v1 equal to one plus x, v2 may be equal to. Pratibam, Pratibam, Rajesh, Rajesh is saying something. Sorry. Ha ha. Yes. Yeah. So I understood a little bit. So, but the homotopy perturbation method. So for p equal zero, you said this operator is solvable, and you want to do for p equals one. Ha. And so in the if you do this expansion. then p is not small so does that cause any problem because you want to get to p equal to 1 right yes i i want to take limit p tends to 1 but p lies between 0 to 1 only so p is a small quantity because since p to the power n is appearing here so this part will yeah. always go to 0 as n tends to infinity okay thank you so p p is lying between 0 to 1 only okay okay so uh, Okay, so what I was telling is, uh, uh, suppose v not equal to one and v one equal to x and v two equal to uh, x plus uh, sine x, let's say, then uh, I'll consider the basis functions as one x sine x. That means I'll not uh, so uh, whatever functions will be appearing here, that one I'll be taking it as a uh, basis function, and then I'll choose some combination uh, of those functions to be get a better approximation than to get what we are having here. so this is let me just come to the hpm part so that's what i have explained so you find out uh, what is called uh, approximation phi nx by homotopy perturbation find out the uh, independent linearly independent functions from phi nx suppose phi nx is equal to x square plus sin x then you write x square here sin x here and one here like that similarly you find out phi n plus 1 phi n plus 1 is having some other functions then uh, you construct another basis which is containing the previous basis plus some additional basis this is the, this is the meaning of that the previous basis elements will be there plus additional elements will be also added so i am having bigger basis bigger elements so i have to choose this c n k constants so how do i choose this c n k now one of the approach is the least square so this is what is this is how the least square does you Uh, this is the r is defining the residual error you have a is the original operator which is given phi n bar is the approximation so a phi n bar minus f is not equal to 0 but uh, whatever it is i wanted to approximate this guy uh, by uh, minimizing integral 0 to t r square okay so this is what so the I'll, of course so the since this guy is involving r square so del j del ck Equal to zero, I have to be sure, and then from I'll be having n number of equations. Uh, huh. So n number of equations from there I'll be getting what is c1, c2, ck. Once I obtain c1, c2, ck, I'll put it here. I'll get a better approximation compared to what I am having in H. Okay. So this is the last uh, uh, theorem. Uh, it shows that uh, the residual error obtained by least square HPM, that means the modified version of. Uh, uh, constructing a new basis will uh, go to zero as n tends to infinity in fact uh, in this work i have also uh, given you uh, some uh, uh, error estimate that is not uh, mentioned here uh, ha this is the error estimate ha. in terms of whole error so that is also given here so in terms of whole domain capital t 
So as you uh, can see that uh, uh, if I increase my domain, then uh, the error is coming out to be large, little larger. OK, so numerically, uh, yeah, let us take a uh, problem. Numerically means what? Numerically means uh, you take uh, alpha as a fixed quantity 4 by 5 and uh, mu also something so that this problem is having a unique solution. And then uh, how do I be able to find out uh, the error if I don't know the solution? The answer is you find out what is uh, phi 1, phi 2, phi k by using HPM, homotopy perturbation. And then you uh, call this one as a phi n, this minus this quantity. And if you call as this one, if is equal to only this 2x plus 3x to the power 3 by 2. You minimize this quantity by using HPM. So, so as you, uh, so this is the LS HPM. As you can see here, that uh, based on, uh, of course, since it is a, this is a series solution, okay. So that means I have to increase always the number of terms in the series. So here I have taken three terms, four terms, five terms, so like that. For three terms, the error is a little more, 1.28. But uh, modified one is having 10 to the power minus 4 level. Right? And there is another observation is as n goes to infinity, the error should converge to zero. Uh, that also you can see here 10 to the power minus 1, 10 to the power minus 2. Uh, in the modified one, 10 to the power minus 5, 10 to the power minus 7. So as n goes to infinity, the number of terms in the series going to infinity, errors are uh, going to zero. <clears throat> this is the graphical plot. Uh, this is uh, this plot is uh, for the error. Error means uh, so you see that this blue color line is the HPM. That means the error is of the 10 to the power minus 4 level, whereas red color line is the least square HPM, modified least square, which we have proposed. Uh, that means it is much lesser compared to what we are having in HPM. So, uh, so we are almost in the finishing stage. Uh, so this conclusion says that, uh, uh, of course, uh, there is a problem on the existence uniqueness that we have fixed that is depending on alpha and mu, fractional derivatives order, as well as weakly singular kernels order. And uh, the error uh, is also in the L2 norm. L2 norms are good also in the sense that we can have a uh, we may not be having a differential function, but still you can find out the error in L2 now. Uh, and HPM is uh, modified to LS HPM. So if you wanted to look into the more, uh, especially on this work, you can look. Sorry, 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 sorry. This is a different one. Uh, yeah. If you want to look more, especially on this work, you can look into this paper. Uh, here, the, of course, the motivation part is. Uh, uh, is not there. <coughs> Only the um, uh, calculation uh, difficulties part are appearing. And uh, this book is uh, very, uh, in, in some sense, this is the one of the old book on the fractional derivatives. And after that, nowadays, in this decade, uh, more or less, everybody is working on the fractional differential equations. But as I said that, uh, very less applications are appearing in fractional derivatives. They are mainly working on the theoretical side uh, uh, from extension of classical derivatives to fractional derivatives. But one of the link is uh, as long as you are having an uh, application of integral equations in terms of uh, integral differential equations or non-local uh, business, we can also relate these fractional derivatives to uh, integral form, integral equation form. And uh, maybe later it will be useful for other people who so will be working on non-local uh, setup. So this is the this is the the fractional part. Uh, thank you. I I think I have uh, just in time. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratibhamadas. It was really interesting for me at least because. Uh, Recently, in last couple of years, I was working on the inverse problem generated from the fractional uh, fractional differential equations. Yeah. So quickly, if, we, if somebody has some questions, comments, uh, just two minutes we have maximum. <laughs> we are already crossing the time, but let's keep two minutes for this. I can see the participants. That is the oh, and now I can see the participants. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
very quickly. Okay, there are five students here having uh, from MSC batch. <laughs> they are our students. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, okay. So uh, the people so, who are new here, they can. Yeah, Rajas, please. Uh, so, I mean, uh, no, no, uh, uh, it's very. It was very interesting for me, the talk and some nice ideas. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was thinking that let us, it is better to have some basic because otherwise, uh, I mean, it is very uh, annoying that how could uh, everybody knows everybody's research if someone yeah. started to uh, present yeah. his research immediately from first slide itself. Yeah. No, but this is also, uh, no, it's a good idea to what you did. That's exactly, I agree with uh, all of you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I will, uh, if there is no comment and commentary, we'll stop here. And uh, Pratibha, I have sent you one links in the Facebook, so you can check it out. Okay, so uh, the the participants who attended, uh, who are not, who wants to be regular, uh, can send me their email address. I will include you into the, into the, uh, into the advertisement. Uh, so we can, we, we do it every week anyway. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patiba, one more time. And uh, see you thank some you. other time in India. Okay, thank you, Rajesh. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Huh? Okay, you look at Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. 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 Only sir, definition, sir, but I can't see any of space actually. But it is sir more interesting thing. Interesting thing, Matlab? Is it interesting? Why sir? Why negative? Why negative derivative? Negative parcel is not exist. Only sir, one is gamma function is not exist in negative sign. Only this. Or yeah, negative function does not exist in the negative side that is okay but there are other uh, parts also yes uh, like uh, because uh, whenever you're talking about the derivatives uh, we mainly talk about the positive derivative not the negative derivative because one can say that negative derivative does it mean that it is integral d inverse does it mean that it is an integral or not one can think of it. Uh, yeah this so if it is integral, then why do I need the initial condition? That is also one yes. question one can ask. Yes, sir. Please share the slide with us. Huh? Share the slide share the slide with us. नहीं मतलब अभी मतलब जिस बंदे ने मुझे इनवाइट किया था वो अभी फिर से एक मुझे फेसबुक पे मैसेज भेजा है कि वो भी इस पे काम कर रहा है मुझे पता नहीं था कि वो इस पे काम कर रहा है बट एटलीस्ट वो भी इस पे काम कर रहा है दैट इज गुड बट सर पार्टिब्यूशन सर पार्टिब्यूशन जो टॉपिक है ना वो तो न्यूमेरिकल का आपका टॉपिक है ना रिसर्च का पार्टिब्यूशन जो है वो एग्जैक्टली न्यूमेरिकल नहीं है वो थोड़ा सा Approximation type का है, numerical तो है नहीं वो। सर वो x equal to b वाला जो solution है ना, उसका जो part two solution a plus del x plus del x b plus del b। कौन सा कौन सा? x equal to b जो system of equation है ना, उसका part two solution a plus del a into x plus del x equal to b plus del b। मेरा subject में मैंने जो दिखाया था वो वाला पूछ रहे हो क्या? हाँ 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 तो उसमें क्या है वो तो सर आपका पीएचडी टॉपिक है ना न्यूमेरिकल का जो ना ना हाँ सिंगुलर पार्टिब्यूशन इस माय टॉपिक बट ये वाला एक्जेक्टली मतलब ये तुम शायद इसकी बात कर रहे हो मेरे ख्याल से इसकी बात कर रहे हो ना 
दिस इज होमोटोपी वर्जन वर्जन ना बिकॉज ए वन मतलब दोनों फंक्शन कब ये होगा पार्ट्रेविजन में मतलब सर पार्ट्रेविजन तो कुछ सॉल्यूशन पे चेंज होने के बाद कितना माने इसमें चेंज होने के बाद कितना सॉल्यूशन में चेंज होता है ना पार्ट्रेविजन अच्छा अच्छा नहीं वो पार्ट्रेविजन ये पार्ट्रेविजन थोड़ा सा डिफरेंट है ये ये सिमिलर पार्ट्रेविजन ये पार्ट्रेविजन थोड़ा पार्ट्रेविजन मतलब तुम स्टेबिलिटी की बात कर रहे हो तो ये कोई चेंज द वो पॉजिटिव बिट देन सॉल्यूशन विल बी ऑफ द चेंज इन लिटिल बिट वो अलग चीज है दोनों का अंदर में वही डिफरेंस है बहुत मतलब दोनों ही अलग है सर जो जेएनएफ जेएनएफ वाला जो है ना जेएनएफ इक्वल टू इंटीग्रेशन 0 टू x जेएन माइनस 1f इफ वी रिकरेंस दिस रिलेशन जेएनएफ इक्वल टू इंटीग्रेशन 0 टू x जेएन माइनस 1f ना ये तो फास्ट 10 नंबर से रह रहे इंटीग्रल ऑपरेटर सो दैट इज इक्वल टू जे जो मैं अभी अभी दिखा रहा था तो भी नॉट इक्वल टू इंटीग्रल ऑफ एफ होगा तो कहां पे लिखा है डी अल्फा भी नॉट इज इक्वल टू एफ भी नॉट इक्वल टू इंटीग्रल ऑफ एफ डी अल्फा ऑफ वी आई प्लस एन इक्वल टू दिस तो भी नॉट इक्वल टू जी अल्फा जी अल्फा ऑफ एफ और जी अल्फा ऑफ दिस ऐसे आएगा कहां पे यहां पे तो नहीं लिखा है ये ऐसा आएगा मतलब डी अल्फा का डी अल्फा इज अ डिफरेंशियल ऑपरेटर उसका इनवर्स होगा तुम्हारा इंटीग्रल ऑपरेटर वो है जी उसे करस्पोंडिंग तो देन यू विल बी फाइंडिंग व्हाट इज बी नॉट तो बी नॉट विल बी इसका बी नॉट को पुट कर दोगे यहां पे तो तुम्हें बी1 मिलेगा सिमिलरली बी1 का पुट करके बी2 मिलेगा ऐसे तो मैं करते जाऊंगा ठीक है हां इफ इज अ रिकरेंस इन दिस रिलेशन देन जेएनएफ इक्वल टू 0 टू एक्स जेएन माइनस 1 एफ ना कौन सा कौन सी रिकरेंस रेंज की बात कर रहा हूं जेएनएफ मतलब के जेएनएफ मतलब जे 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 एफ बस जे ऑफ जे जे क्यूब इक्वल टू जे ऑफ जे स्क्वायर एफ वो भी हो सकता है यहां पे भी तो है सर ये बोल ये दिस इज ट्रू दैट सर इफ आई टेक टू फंक्शन ओवर होमोट्रोपी एंड देन द फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव ऑफ टू फंक्शन इज इक्वल मतलब इक्वल होगा एट दैट पॉइंट अगर टू फंक्शन होमोटोपिक है तो तो दोनों का फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव एक पॉइंट पे एक ही होगा मतलब सेम होगा है ना दो फंक्शन होमोटोपिक है होमोटोपिक मतलब के एक कार्ड से तुम दूसरे कार्ड में अप्रोच कर दो हां एक तो दोनों तो फंक्शन तो दोनों डिफरेंट ही है ना दोनों फंक्शन होमोटोपिक मतलब सर उसके बीच में वो जो मतलब एक कंटीन्यूअस फंक्शन ढूंढते हैं ऐसा फंक्शन होमोटोपिक में सी कैन अप्रोच फ्रॉम वन कर्व टू अनदर कर्व दैट मतलब बेस्ड ऑन ए होमोटोपिक बस उतना ही 
और तो कुछ नहीं तो उसके मतलब तो ये नहीं है कि दोनों कार्ड का फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव पे सेम होगा तेरा होमोटॉपिक इन कॉम्प्लेक्स एनालिसिस टू कार्ड का इंटीग्रेशन जो होता है एक मतलब दो कार्ड पर कार्ड होमोटॉपिक है तो दो कार्ड के ऊपर जो इंटीग्रेशन होता है दोनों एक ही होता है सेम होता है इंटीग्रल वैल्यू तो अच्छा वो होमोटॉपिक और ये होमोटॉपिक तो डिफरेंट है अब हम हमें ओइटरी को ओइटरी को ना ना वो होमोटॉपिक ये होमोटॉपिक वो तो अच्छा 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 अभी समझ में आया नो नो दैट इज डिफरेंट ना ना मैं उसी का बात बोल रहा हूँ अगर होमोटॉपिक अगर दोनों कार्ड के ऊपर है दोनों कार्ड का इंटीग्रेशन एम आर डेरिवेटिव क्या सेम होगा बिकॉज दिस इज बेस्ड ऑन द इंटीग्रल ना ये फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव मतलब आ रहा है तो इंटीग्रल से ही तो इंटीग्रल से अगर आ रहा है तो फिर दोनों का अगर होमोटॉपिक होगा तो दोनों के ऊपर जो सेम डेरीवेटिव होगा वो भी सेम होगा फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव आ रहा है इंटीग्रल से हेलो उसमें जो होमोटोपी है हेलो हाँ उसमें उसमें जो होमोटोपी है टू कार्ब्स आर होमोटोपिक उसके बाद आई अंडरस्टूड व्हाट यू आर आस्किंग बट दैट इज डिफरेंट बिकॉज योर एफ जेड शुड बी आल्सो एनालिटिक फंक्शन और डिफरेंशियल फंक्शन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वहां पे जो एनालिटिक फंक्शन और डिफरेंशियल फंक्शन का डिफिनेशन अलग है दैट इज नॉट सेम विद दिस डिफिनेशन कॉम्प्लेक्स डिफेंशियबिलिटी एंड रियल डिफेंशियबिलिटी इज फुल्ली डिफरेंट रिलेट कर सकते हो क्या मतलब उधर पे जो एनालिटिक फंक्शन है इसका जो फ्रैक्शनल का पार्शन है मान लीजिए मेरे पास वन डेरिवेटिव एग्जिस्ट है मेरे नहीं ने सर एनालिटिक तो एनालिटिक जो भी होय तले कि हमें बोलते बार बोलते जो और माने 3/2 टाइम माने जो कोनो फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव एग्जिस्ट करबे अरे हमारे बहुत আমাদের এক্সিস্ট হচ্ছে যে আমাদের একটা ডেরিভেটিভ এক্সিস্ট মানে হাফ ডেরিভেটিভ মানে এক ডেরিভেটিভ এক্সিস্ট করলে ওটার সঙ্গে এটা দুটো একই হয়ে যাচ্ছে এন্ড সেকেন্ড ডেরিভেটিভ এক্সিস্ট করলে ফ্র্যাকশনাল ফ্র্যাকশনাল ডেরিভেটিভটা ইউজ করছেন এটা রিয়েল ভ্যালুড ফাংশনের ক্ষেত্রে না যে কোনো ভ্যালুড ফাংশনের ক্ষেত্রে রিয়েল ভ্যালুড ফাংশনের ক্ষেত্রে আমি ইউজ করছি তাহলে স্যার কমপ্লেক্সের সঙ্গে তো রিয়েল এর ওই অ্যানালিটিসিটিতেই তো ডিফারেন্স এসে যাবে না হ্যাঁ সেটাই তো বলছি ডিফারেনশিয়েশনে তো ডিফারেন্স আই থিং মানে কমপ্লেক্সের बट कॉम्प्लेक्स रूप की माने कोनो फ्रैक्शनल डेरिवेटिव एग्जिस्ट करे ना कॉम्प्लेक्स रूप है कोत्ते ही पारे ताले ओई रकम भाबे डिफाइन आस्ते होवे एई डेफिनेशन दिया होवे ना होयतो होते पारे मे बी बट डेफिनेशन हमरा कंटिन्यूटी ते जा डिफरेंशियल इन डेफिनेशन पाए लिमिट रियल तो सेम डेफिनेशन पाए मे बी सिर्फ वेरी वेल डिफरेंशियबिलिटी थेके तो डिफरेंशियबिलिटी थेके तो मूल तो डिफरेंस ता होच्छ ना रियल कॉम्प्लेक्स से हाँ तो एखने जिरो टू एक्स पासी जिरो टू एक्स पासी तो जिरो टू एक्स टाइम पैरामेट्रिक कार्ड हिसाब से जिरो टू एक्स पैरामेट्रिक कार्ड पे तो कमप्लेक्स चले गए एक बार डिफरेंस है ना इनफाइनाइट टाइम डिफरेंस है बोल कॉम्प्लेक्स है और ये नहीं करोगे कॉम्प्लेक्स है हमारे को ना एग्जांपल दिया हो जितने एक बार डिफरेंस होने के लिए दूसरी बार हाँ तो कॉम्प्लेक्स है जितने बार वो क्या होना जो भी एनालिटिक ना हो तो लेते बार वो किंतु एनालिटिक खुले I can take sir, अम्मी, उठा ही नहीं नहीं sir, माँ, एक बार defensible but दो बार ना है ना, आज के अम्मी जरा बोल चलें sir, x square minus x square, a a sense जो दिया अम्मी नहीं है, आह उठा के एक टुकड़ों ने दे extend कोड दिया मैं, already line complex रूप पर, z square and minus z square 
মেবি স্যার পাওয়া যাবে স্যার শ্যামা পাওয়া যাবে স্যার একবার ডিফেন্সিভল বাট দুবার না বাট একবার ডিফেন্সিভল সমস্ত পয়েন্টে কিন্তু দুবার না সমস্ত পয়েন্টে ডিফেন্সিভল সমস্ত আচ্ছা অল পয়েন্টে আমি ডোমেন তাহলে হবে না কিন্তু তার মানে 